This is a, an article in New Scientist dated January 19th, 2013 by Helen Pilcher. Quote, when biologists began sequencing genomes, they discovered that up to a third of genes in each species seem to have no parents or family of any kind. Nevertheless, some of these orphan genes are high achievers and a few even seem to have played a part in the evolution of the human brain. But where do they come from? With no obvious ancestry, it was as if these genes had appeared from nowhere. But that couldn't be true. Everyone assumed that as we learn more, we would discover what had happened to their families. But we haven't. Quite the opposite, in fact. As the genomes of more and more organisms were sequenced, Genetic family reunions prove to be the exception rather than the rule. Orphan genes have since been found in every genome sequence to date, from mosquito to man, roundworm to rat, and their numbers are still growing. The study of orphan genes is still in its infancy, and we know very little about most of them. Some orphan genes are involved with the repair and organization of DNA, or in controlling the activity of other genes. The insect orphan gene flighten, which encodes a muscular wing protein, evolved to aid flight. And in a study published last year, Manuel Long of the University of Chicago and his team showed that two recently evolved young insect orphan genes help shape foraging behavior in the fruit fly Drosophila. In corals, jellyfish, and polyps, Orphan genes guide the development of explosive stinging cells, sophisticated structures that launch toxin-filled capsules to stun prey. In the freshwater polyp Hydra, orphans guide the development of feeding tentacles around the organism's mouth. And the polar cod's orphan gene, antifreeze gene, enables it to survive life in the icy arctic. So, here's one story they come up with. In between non-coding DNA and fully fledged genes, uh, the biologist being interviewed thinks there is a whole continuum of proto-genes. Most will code for proteins that are neutral or harmful. So there will be no selection and the vast majority of proto-genes will revert to non-coding DNA sooner or later. But a few protogenes that are neutral or maybe even helpful will sometimes persist and start to gather beneficial mutations. Over millions of years of natural selection, they can become a proper gene, and thus an orphan gene is born. So, I mean, you can see what a, it's just a story someone invented like there's no evidence for that at all uh, if you do a search for de novo like de novo genes on google scholar practically every journal article that comes up is with de novo genes are associated with a disease or disorder or something horrible uh, maybe there are exceptions but in general it seems like really bad things happen uh, to an organism when you begin coding for a protein that's not supposed to be there. Uh, I'm pretty sure that sums up many, many disorders. But this is how the theory of evolution works. Uh, they find something they didn't predict at all and then they create a new hypothetical model to explain it. Uh, the model isn't scientifically motivated. You know, it's not motivated by uh, evidence. It's motivated by the assertion that evolution has to be true. So here is an article in PubMed in January 2013 by uh, Whistler et al. 
It's titled Mechanisms and Dynamics of Orphan Gene Emergence in Insect Genomes. Orphan genes are defined as genes which lack detectable similarity to genes in other species, and therefore no clear signals of common descent can be inferred. Orphans are an enigmatic portion of the genome, since their origin and function are mostly unknown, and they typically make up 10 to 30 percent of all genes in the genome. Uh, and that's a lot. So, uh, the rest of this article, uh, you see how evolutionary assumptions work in the research. Uh, they always begin with the assertion that evolution through common descent must be true, and then they extrapolate data based on that assumption. So, in this case, the researchers compared and contrasted the orphan genes of all these different species of arthropods, and by comparing those, they, they came up with models for how orphan genes must evolve. Uh, this is a, a blog article written in, uh, I think, July 2012 by Ken Weiss, professor of anthropology and genetics. And it's titled, How Can There Be Orphan Genes? Uh, here's some excerpts from it. Orphan genes are individual genes or small gene families that are sequestered within specific taxonomic groups, but have no known related genes outside the group. The term is, of course, a misnomer and could be highly misleading because unless you're a creationist, the DNA that's a gene today had to be in some genome somewhere, ancestrally. But in what form and how did it arise? In modern theory, a combination of duplication and ordinary mutation is responsible for genome evolution. But if genes themselves and or their exons arise by duplication, that creates a family of related sequences. So how can there be orphan genes without a trace of relatives. Uh, you can see how surprised evolutionists are by this, like they didn't expect this at all. Uh, here's some explanations I try and come up with. Uh, this is uh, TAUTS, T-A-U-T-Z, provides a step-by-step -step scenario for de novo gene creation. These authors recognize the stretched plausibility of such ideas, given the seemingly minuscule probability that functional genes with strongly advantageous effects could arise this way. If de novo creation were to happen often, most of the time selection would perhaps remove it. But over millions of years, maybe it happens enough. Could it be that instead, New genes often really do arise by de novo mechanisms and disappear by deletion before they generate large gene families. Um, yeah, they they know how ridiculous this sounds because you know they've been telling everyone for decades that it has to be a very slow, gradual process of incremental mutations that are selected for and. Now they're sort of forced into this new model that de novo genes just spontaneously arise and are somehow selected for, even though they know that is ridiculous. So going on, <clears throat> orphan genes may be simply may be simply be lucky genes in complex systems that happen to survive for us to observe them. Different contributing genes for different reasons, including drift, surviving in different taxa. Uh, the 20% of such genes that are orphans may just be the normal passengers on the train of duplication and deletion. If de novo evolution is common, or more common than we thought, relative to gene duplication, 
we may have to revisit the strong evidence for the evolution of gene evolution by exon duplication and the proliferation of ancient gene families. Have we missed something? I like how he ends that, have we missed something? So I think a good description of the theory of evolution is it's like jello. You can't nail it down anywhere and you can make it fit into anything. Uh, no matter what new data arises, you can mold this thing however you want to fit it. Uh, it's not really falsifiable. I mean, all they really do is make jokes about, uh, oh, if we found a rabbit fossil in the Cambrian, then it would falsify evolution. I mean, that's a joke. They, they can't make any serious predictions. Uh, you know, when they need small gradual mutations to explain the origin of some complex organ, they, they can use that card. Uh, as we saw in these articles, when evolutionists need sudden de novo genes spontaneously arising uh, to explain orphan genes, they'll use that card. So uh, my question is, how exactly do you falsify molecular phylogenetics if finding 20% uh, of orphan genes in all species uh, doesn't doesn't falsify it. Uh, would it matter if 50% of the genome were orphan genes? Like, seriously, I, I don't think it would matter. Uh, I think they could find 80% <laughs> and it wouldn't matter. So it's important to note that this new model of de novo gene creation uh, as an explanation for orphan genes, it, it's not scientifically motivated. There's no empirical data or testable hypothesis that indicate that it is plausible or accurate for, for this to happen. Uh, it's always an ad hoc explanation motivated by belief in the theory itself. Uh, and this happens constantly. Uh, it's, it just comes back to how the philosophy of evolution is so dominant 